we go. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Uh, you can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5, the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, or click there, scroll there. Uh, oh, just one more thing. Um, reminder, on the 23rd of July, we're going to have a big faith family kind of get-together on Governor's Beach. Uh, so we're inviting you to come along, bring a pack a, a breakfast picnic, and we'll have all sorts of games. So that's Saturday, the 23rd of July, 9 a.m. on Governor's Beach. Just a great time to be together and, and have a lot of fun together. So pencil that in. We'll remind you as we get closer to the, the time. Great. Last week... We began answering the question, just how powerful, just how in control and authority does Jesus have? And we can sum it up in the word sovereignty. Uh, in political spheres, it refers to the overriding power or the supreme authority that someone has or a government has. Uh, in democratic uh, countries, apparently the power is with the people who can be represented by various organizations uh, and parties. Uh, those who hold more of a totalitarian view or position, they have the sovereign power and control and authority to make decisions that can drastically affect uh, a company, a country, or even the whole world. And so last week we looked at the sovereign power of Jesus, particularly over nature. And we said nature is not a law until, unto itself. It's not out of control. It's not controlled by Mother Nature, as Avatar would have you believe, but by its creator. Uh, we saw that in the storm that it was about to take out all of the disciples in the boat. Jesus was fast asleep, and then he woke up, and he, sim- he simply spoke and said to the wind and the, and the waves to be still, and, and it immediately obeyed. And we said that faith in the sovereignty of Jesus helps dispel our fears regarding the storms of life and actually begins to redefine or redeem that fear into reverence and awe for Jesus. The right faith produces the right fear and results in great peace and assurance no matter the storms of life we face. And we can face literal storms as we do on this island or metaphorical storms like relationship storms, health storms, you name it. This morning... We continue the theme of Jesus' sovereignty, but this time over evil or the demonic realm. I remember when I was in high school, I, I went to boarding school, and uh, usually I would go home each weekend, but this, this one particular weekend I, I stayed in because I think I had a, a cricket match or something on, on the Saturday. And uh, it was a co-ed boarding school, which meant that the, the girls had their dormitories on the one side and the boys had their dormitories on the other side. And in the middle was the rec room. And the rec room was the place where the TV was and, and all the, you know, the snooker tables and the table tennis and we would all get together and we kind of socialize there. Uh, and now each Friday night, if you stayed in, the, the, the teacher on duty would allow us to get a movie. And for some reason, the seniors thought it'd be a good idea to get a horror movie that particular night. So there I was watching this movie, covered up in my duvet, being freaked out by some alien chasing after Sigourney Weaver, and uh, where it dawned on me that I was the only boy staying in that weekend. Had a look around, and there's all these girls who were scared, but they were all girls. And uh, and then I noticed that the spaceship, they had a lot of corridors, just like a lot of the corridors in the boys' section. So the movie came to an end, and all the girls were relieved, and they went off into their side of the boarding school, and I alone was locked into the boys' side. Now, everything was dark. I I didn't think before the movie started to switch on the lights to the corridors. Everything was dark, and uh, this was an old boarding school, so that if the light switch was on this side of the corridor, down at the other end wouldn't be a corresponding switch. And so I thought, well, I can't... you know, leave the lights on the whole night. And so I, there was me covered in my duvet, kind of sneaking all the way down this long, long corridor, dark corridor with, you know, dormitories on each side and, and bathrooms on each side, you know, the perfect place for aliens and monsters to jump out and, and get me. Eventually managed to get down the one long passage, turned right into the, the next long corridor because my dormitory was right at the end. And, and, and you just kind of got this, this feeling... Like, there, there's stuff around, right? There, there's something following me. And, you know, your, your skin gets that, that, that chill, you know, your skin crawls. And I'll just admit to you, there was a moment where I, I thought I should run back to the girl's side, beat on the door, and beg them to let me in. Uh, but I was a prideful man in the making, so I didn't do that. 
So I finally got to my dorm and I, I sprinted and dived onto my bed. It was the one in the far corner and you know, kind of hid under my duvet. And then you start hearing all of these strange sounds that you've never really heard before or, or because normally there's 10 other guys in the dorm and doing what guys do, you know, snoring and messing around. But you start hearing the, the toilets making these gushing sounds and, you, and, and the pipes and the walls and the, and the ceilings were making these eerie, watery sounds and, and you just are convinced that there's an alien coming down the passage and you're just waiting for it to come through the doorway. Needless to say, I, I never slept a wink that particular weekend. But in situations like that, your, your mind jumps to the concept of evil, particularly the spiritual realm. And you begin to wonder, well, just how real is it? Or, and, and just how powerful is it? Now, the concept of evil, demons, and the devil can result in, in, in one of two extremes. Uh, you know, one being there's, there's a devil under every bush. You know, you get to Foster's and your favorite parking spot's taken, and you're like, ah, oh, the devil. You know, he's out to get me today. Or, you know, you look at some of the worst diabolical acts of man in history, and you diagnose it, or you simply explain it away as, oh, it's because he didn't have a father figure. Now, Make no mistake, the Bible tells us that we are sinners and we can and have had, you know, performed some heinous sins in this world. But the Bible is also very, very clear that we have an enemy who has a vast number of demonic minions, if you like, who are at his beck and call. And so in our next story in the Gospel of Mark, we're going to address this issue of evil in light of the sovereign power of Jesus. And my aim this morning is that we don't fall into the one trap of simply excusing it away or pretending it's not there, or at the same time not falling into the other trap where we give it more power and fear and attention than it deserves, but rather that our faith would be built up in the sovereignty of Jesus over the devil, his demons, and their effects. So the story is quite long, and so we're going to split it up under these following points. Number one, the possessing power of evil. Then we'll look at the delivering power of Jesus, and then finally, the witnessing power of a transformed life. So here we go, the possessing power of evil. The first thing that this story is going to show us is that evil is real. And it has the power to possess, and by possession, I mean the ability to take hold of and to own and if it does that, it can influence and result in a lot of destruction in our lives and those around us. Have a look at Mark chapter 5 with me. So they, that's Jesus and his disciples. They came to the other side of the sea. So remember, they, they made it through the storm and it's all calm. And they, they eventually dock on the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the country of the Gerasians. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. Let's pause there for a second. Matthew's gospel tells us he was extremely violent and no one passed by that way. Matthew 8.28. Luke adds, he says that he was naked and had not worn clothes for a very, very long time. And so you can imagine what this guy looks like, or maybe we shouldn't imagine what this guy looks like. I mean, he's probably you know, very weather-beaten skin, overgrown hair, malnourished, and more at home with the dead than he is with those who are alive. And so evil seems to have this fascination with the dead. Now, I haven't watched a lot of horror movies, certainly not after my experience in boarding school. But even Hollywood seems to have picked up on this, on this theme, you know, with movies like Zombies and, and Dracula and, and, and Ghosts and things like that. And why is that? Because the fruit of all evil is death. It's the exact opposite of what Jesus came to do. John 10.10 10 says, The thief, talking about the devil, comes only to steal and kill and destroy, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so this guy is hanging out in the tombs because he is possessed by this unclean spirit. It's grabbed hold of him to the degree that he no longer resides in the comfort of his community, his family, and his friends. And of the 30 times this word unclean is used in the Gospels, 19 times refers to, or is used for demons. And it has the basic meaning of moral corruption, especially regarding sexual sin. Hence why many scholars believe this guy is naked. 
John MacArthur describes him like this. He says, he is a maniac. He's deranged. He's irrational. He's dangerous. He's subhuman, antisocial, sociopathic, and intensely evil. He's a monster. Nakedness for him was related to his sexual perversion. He is as wicked as wicked gets. He is a man that fits into a, ca into a category that we're somewhat familiar with when we are exposed to sociopathic people who have deviant sexual attitudes, who are dangerous to themselves and dangerous to people all around them. And we might think, well, thank goodness this was way back in the first century. But unfortunately not. Today we celebrate this in one of the highest revenue generating evils of our day, the pornographic industry. Instead of some demon possessed pervert hanging out in the tombs, it's just a click away on our phones or on our computers. And dare I say it is producing monsters. MacArthur made another good point in that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and were ashamed of their nakedness and attempted to cover their, their nakedness up with leaves, God, by His grace, came along and sacrificed two animals and covered them up with, with uh, the animal skins. And you can kind of say it was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do on the cross for us, for our sins, in covering our sin. But evil, in its absolute disdain for God, has been influencing His prized creation to uncover themselves in an act of rebellion. So pornography is not an art form. It is one of the epitomes of evil and of the devil. I'm also not going to lecture you on how you should dress. That is between you and the Lord. But I'm just asking you to consider the theology. God covered the nakedness of their shame and culture today under the sphere and influence of the devil is trying to uncover that nakedness. I mean, just look at fashion throughout the, throughout the centuries. Is fashion becoming more conservative or less conservative? Every time we put on our clothes, it's a reminder of the gospel that Jesus has covered up our sins by his blood and we are clothed in his righteousness. And one day he will restore us back to that innocence in the new heavens and the new earth. But in the meantime, things seem to be out of control just as it was with this man the rest of verse 3 says, And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. This is a very dangerous man. He's completely out of control. His community here attempted to subdue him as best they could. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how they managed to, to shackle him. Maybe they knocked him out with a blow to the head. But then he just simply, as the, as the text says, snapped the chains and, and broke the shackles in pieces. And so this tells us, as finite human beings, we do not have the ability or the strength to overcome evil. We don't have it in ourselves. We're fighting a spiritual realm that is beyond our natural ability to overcome. And then verse 5 tells us, not only was this man tormenting all of those who came by the tombs, he himself was greatly tormented. It says, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. This guy never slept, constantly tormented by these demons. And so we think, okay, put demons aside for two seconds. Medical experts say that long-term sleep deprivation can lead, it, can lead to its own forms of psychiatric disorders like disorientation, paranoia, and even hallucinations. And so we get the impression that he was attempting to get rid of them by cutting himself with stones. He was attempting to release some of the torment or cut himself free from them. Again, you can only imagine how this made him look. So his community were unable to help. They're unable to restrain him. He himself is unable to help himself. This is truly a living hell for himself. Now I was thinking... If I had to see this guy running down Seven Mile Beach, I, I, I wouldn't think, oh, well, there's an alternative lifestyle that's quite tempting and alluring. No worries. I mean, I'm only too grateful I didn't think of this guy when I was alone in my dormitory that, that weekend. This, this type of thing makes me want to run to Jesus with everything that I have and away from the devil. So it got me thinking, well, what is the devil's plan? What is he up to? 
So just some context, Jesus and his disciples have just docked in the country of the Gerasenes, and this is largely a Gentile country or part of the world, which means they probably worshipped all sorts of false gods and idols, which means they were playing right into the devil's plan. He will use anything and everything to get you to not worship Jesus, even if it means not worshipping the devil himself directly. And he's brilliant at doing this. In his famous passage on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us that the devil has schemes. He's, he's constantly planning. He's constantly plotting things to deceive mankind from God, even us as Christians, as believers. For instance, in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, Paul tells the Corinthians, he warns the Corinthians that the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. He's going to come across as a nice person, solid person. He's going to come across as a preacher and a teacher. We know he knows his theology pretty well, so, so he can twist it ever so much and lead us astray. I mean, he tried to do this with, with Jesus during his temptation in the wilderness. And so Jesus and the New Testament writers, they warn us of these false teachers and they describe them as wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible also describes him as the tempter. That means he knows our needs, he, he knows our desires, he knows our longings, he's been around long enough and so he's studied mankind and so he, he will present us with tempting situations that promise to fulfill those desires, promise to fulfill those longings and those needs. And he appeals to our sinful nature. And if we take the bait and we continue to fall for his schemes and his tricks, we could spiral into all sorts of horrible consequences, dare I say even addictions. So maybe in the case of this man, he began by worshipping a false god or, or idol of sorts and he opened himself up to the possession of the devil and now that has spiraled out of control. He's not even in control of himself, his mind, his body even. So the power of the devil is real. It's alluring and it's tempting with horrible consequences. But now let's begin to move towards the hope, towards the good news. But I'll say throughout all of this, I couldn't stop thinking about the poor disciples. I mean, their, their nerves must be absolutely shot. You know, I, I imagine as they're approaching the, the shore, Jesus is completely fine. You know, he's like singing along, this is the day that I've made type of thing. And the poor disciples are still, you know, scooping water out of the, out of the boat and they're freaked out by this storm. They're even more freaked out by the, the sovereign storm calming power of Jesus. Now they dock on the other side and this naked, gashed up, screaming monster comes running down toward them from the tombs. And they're like, great. First the mega storm, now the boogeyman. I mean, this is life with, with Jesus. So what can Jesus do? Number two, the delivering power of Jesus. Like we said, this, this guy's community couldn't help him. They couldn't restrain him. He couldn't set himself free from the torment either. He needs a savior. He needs someone that has more power, more authority than the devil himself. Look at verse six. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you, I beg you, by God, do not torment me. Verse 8, For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. I mean, that, that's no joke. Legion is actually a military term for up to 6,000 soldiers. Verse 10, and he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000 so that gives us an indication as to how many demons were in this poor guy. They rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and drowned in the sea. So in answering the question, well, just how much power and authority and control does Jesus have over evil? The demons pretty much give us all the answers here. You see, the devil and his cronies, they're not an, an equal but 
opposing or opposite force to Jesus. There isn't this like intense cosmic battle going out there in the spiritual stratosphere between Jesus and the devil, and we're all on tender hooks wondering who's going to win at the end of the day. No, no, as soon as they see Jesus, verse 6 tells us, they fall down before him. It's the Greek word proskuneo. It means to worship, it means to demonstrate submission, it means to show respect to someone greater than yourself. It's absolutely incredible. Like we've been saying, no one has been able to restrain these demons. The community has been able to get them to submit, not even the possessed man. But at their very first sight of Jesus, they can't hit the ground fast enough or hard enough. And, and, and they don't challenge Jesus. They don't mock Jesus. It's just sheer fear and reverence for him. That's because they recognize him straight away. They call him Jesus, son of the most high God. And this is chapter 5 of the Gospel of, of Mark. And to date, no one has identified Jesus as the Son of God other than demons. Only when we get to chapter 8 and, and at the end of the book do some begin to get it. And so most high God is a phrase that is often used to describe God in the Old Testament. It's the, it's the phrase El Elyon in, in the original Hebrew. It means possessor of heaven and possessor of earth. In other words, the one true sovereign God over all realms, the spiritual realm being the heavenly realm and the physical realm or the earthly realm. And they see it straight away in Jesus. And so they are pressed down in the dirt before him in absolute fear and trepidation. And the rest of their conversation with Jesus is one of begging him. And the reason why is because of what they say in verse 7. They say, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So what does he mean? What do they mean by this? You see, the devil and his demons, they, they know that they're living on borrowed time. They know their ultimate face, fate is to be cast into, the, into hell for all eternity. Matthew's gospel tells us, says, have you come to torment us before the time? Before judgment day? Luke's gospel says they begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. The abyss or the pit uh, seems to be a place where demons can be, can be uh, sent in the interim before their, their final judgment and condemnation into hell. And so they're fearful and they're, they're confused. They're saying, is this it? Is this the end? We know who you are. We know you're the sovereign God of heaven and earth who will send all those who are in rebellion against you into hell one day. Is that, is that now? And so instead of sending them to the abyss, they begged him earnestly to send them into the pigs instead. And that also tells us a lot about the sovereign delivering power of Jesus. Verse 13 says, Jesus gave them permission to do exactly that. Now this is not the, the first or the last time we see Jesus giving permission or evil asking permission of Jesus. In, back in the Old Testament, in the book of Job, the devil comes along to God and he asks permission to test the faithfulness or the dedication of Job to God. And God not only gives the devil permission, but he also gives boundaries as to what the devil can and can't do. And it's interesting that the devil com complies to those boundaries. He's bound by the sovereign overruling power of God. Then in the New Testament, Jesus says to Peter that the devil has asked if he can sift him like wheat. Luke 22, look at this. Simon, Simon, or Peter, Peter. Behold, Satan demanded, or other translations say ask, to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So you said no, Jesus, right? Because that's just a freaky thing. Jesus says, verse 32, But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. Most likely referring to the time when, when Peter would deny Jesus three times. But look at this. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Not if you turn again, but when you turn again. Jesus knows Peter's faith will not ultimately fail. How does he know that? Because as the sovereign, all-powerful God, he is the one praying for Peter. He's mediating for Peter. And after his resurrection, he personally comes along and he restores Peter. This is wonderfully comforting news for us, Sunrise. Jesus has absolute sovereign power over evil. Other than our salvation, this was Jesus' mission. Look at this, 1 John 3, 8. 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Those works refer to his ability to have a hold over us or to possess us or to have influence and power. And so as born-again Christians who have now been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into Jesus' kingdom, we cannot be possessed by the devil. As we said, possession refers to ownership. We are now in a new kingdom under a new ownership. We are possessed, if you like, by the Holy Spirit. So Paul tells us this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now it doesn't mean that we can sit back in a sense of apathy. Rather, it means that through Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can now resist the works of the devil. We can now have the discernment to recognize his temptations and his schemes. We can now have access to the full armor of God so that we can stand against the devil. And then one day, the promise is at the return of Jesus, he will throw the devil and all of his minions into this lake of fire for all eternity. So, we rest under the sovereign protection of Jesus, and we are to be alert or vigilant under the sovereign power of Jesus. So we rest, and we are to be vigilant all under his sovereign control. But now the story is not quite finished. The possessed man, he's now delivered by the power of Jesus. But we are also about to see the deceptive, blinding power of the devil in another group. So the demons all enter the pigs and they go off and they jump off the cliff. Some say they performed a swine dive. Same reaction this morning. (laughs) That's what happens when you borrow someone else's joke. Verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. Verse 15, And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Now, why are they afraid? They're afraid just like the demons were afraid. And instead of celebrating the good news of the deliverance of this man, they they beg Jesus to leave. I I don't get it. I mean, if I was there, if I was one of Jesus' disciples, I'd be like, guys, are are you serious? This is a miracle. I mean, you know, you recognize this guy? It's, It's Frank. I mean, we don't know what his name was, but here is Frank. Yes, he's, you know, had a tough time. Lady, but look at him. He's set free. He's not going to be a menace anymore. And it's all to thank because of this guy, Jesus. In in fact, this little incident is a foretaste of what Jesus is going to accomplish for us on the cross. He's going to break the power of the devil over. He's going to disarm the devil. And by faith in him, we'll be translated into his kingdom under his authority and under his power. That's good news. And they're like, "Mm mm-mm. We don't care. We want you and your Jesus to get into your little boat and go back to where you came from. This guy has just destroyed our economy. He's dangerous. He literally just destroyed our pork industry. It just ran off the edge of the cliff. He's too dangerous. They're more afraid of the delivering power of Jesus than the destructive power of the possessed man. In other words, they're saying, we like the way things were. With him insane up there in the tombs and us with our economy and our, and our pork industry. I think the Apostle Paul hits the nail on the head when he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In their case, the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Who's standing there right in front of them but they're blinded. And this is what he does. I think this is worse than various forms of possession. He blinds us. He blinds us with wealth. You don't don't need a savior. Look at the size of your bank account. Anything goes wrong, you've got more than enough money. He he blinds us with material stuff. You want to be comfortable in this world? Well, you need to get that, you need to get that, you need to get more of that. 
He blinds us with lust for each other. Just go after him. Just go after him. It doesn't matter the whole marriage thing. Don't just go for it. We'll just click away. No one will know. He blinds us with atheism. You're far too intellectual to believe in the concept of a creator. I mean, come on. He blinds us with other religions. Hey, man, all paths lead to God at the end of the day. He blinds us with the next world view of our ever-changing culture adopts. Hey, man, you can identify as whatever you want these days. Whatever it takes to keep us from seeing and believing in the good news of Jesus. But Jesus doesn't seem to be too worried about this because he has another plan up his sleeve. Look at the last point together. The witnessing power of a transformed life. Verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. You see, the, to be transformed doesn't only mean to be delivered from evil. It doesn't only mean to receive a miracle. It includes a new allegiance, an allegiance to Jesus. And that allegiance is demonstrated here by this earnest desire to follow Jesus and to live for Jesus. The former possessed man begged to be with Jesus. There's a lot of begging going on in this story. You know, but this is, this is the only one that demonstrates a transformed or a saved life. The demons begged to depart from Jesus into the pigs. The townsfolk begged Jesus to leave them alone. But he wants nothing more than to be with Jesus. And that's all Jesus needs to turn this guy into a missionary or a witness for him. Look at verse 19. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home. Go home to your friends. I, I love that. It's just mercy. I don't know. We don't know how long he'd been possessed by these demons and hanging out in the, the tombs. But Jesus says, Go home to your friends. Go be reunited. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, this big area, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. So maybe Jesus was thinking, well, well, if they don't listen to me, then maybe they will listen to the effects of me seen in the transformed life of this man. This guy has had no theological training at all. He couldn't have spent more than a couple of hours with Jesus, and yet he's the very first missionary Jesus sent off. Jesus hasn't even sent off his disciples yet. And this guy knew a grand total of three things. He knew who he used to be. He knows Jesus. And now he knows who he is in light of Jesus. Or we can say he was under the possession of darkness, and now he knows he's under the possession of the light, Jesus' kingdom. And now this man with a transformed life and a transformed purpose, he goes and he proclaims the good news of Jesus. And the result, everyone marveled. And that's my prayer for us. That we would all marvel at the all supreme sovereign power of Jesus even over evil. That we wouldn't just simply excuse evil away, pretend it's not there, and thereby fall into things that we shouldn't fall into. And that we also wouldn't give it undue attention and too much fear, but rather know that the same God who set this man free is the same God who looks over us and who is protecting us and died to break the power of the devil over us. So, as we have been accustomed to doing now in finishing off our series question, who do you say I am? And Jesus, you'll ask this in chapter 8. Who do you say I am in light of this story? You can say, Jesus, you are the one in whom the presence of evil cannot stand. And therefore, by faith in you, we are able to stand against the devil against all evil. Let's pray together. I think just in this moment, why don't you pray if there was something that the Lord 
um, showed you as we've been going through the text. Won't you just bring that before him right now? Whatever it might be. An area where you think the, the devil has some particular hold over you. Or an area where you, you just can't seem to beat this thing. You just keep falling into the same trap. Or you suspect that you are being deceived by someone or something. Won't you bring that before him now? Won't you ask him for discernment? Won't you ask him for his sovereign power to set you free from that? Whatever it might be. Maybe it's some lustful habit. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's doubt. That the devil has sown into your mind that you believe. Ask him for discernment. Ask him for that power to break it. Set you free. Maybe you fall into the camp where you, you don't really think about this concept of evil. And so ask him to give you more of a sensitivity so that you don't walk into situations that you ultimately will regret. Or maybe you fall into the camp where you've given it far too much attention, far too much fear, and it's almost paralyzed you. Ask him to set you free from that. To know that you know that you are in the kingdom of light under his sovereign power, under his mercy. Jesus, please don't let anyone leave here without knowing that knowing that they know that you are the king over their lives. You are the one who possesses them. There's someone here, Jesus, who doesn't know you as their Lord, as their Savior. Right now, would you open their spiritual eyes and their heart to see you and believe in you and be set free from their sin and the, the grips of the devil. Just cry out to him now in your heart, Lord, please forgive me. Please be my Lord and my Savior. Set me free. Bring me into your kingdom. We pray this all in your delivering awesome power. Amen. Won't you stand one last time?